It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker. His name is Gary F. Thomas, and there's a lot of initials. J.D. L.L.M. C.L.U. C.H.F.C. We'll go over a few of them so that you'll understand what they are. On um, where um, Gary later on can fill in the rest. Gary is a native of Pittsfield, Mass, and is a graduate of Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts and Western New England College Law School. He is a member of the Massachusetts Bar and holds a prestigious Master of Laws in Taxation degree from Boston University Law School. Gary is a chartered life underwriter and a chartered financial consultant. Gary has addressed financial professionals in the United States, Britain, including the life underwriters of the Ukraine. Gary is a member of the Board of Directors of the Carson Center for Families and Children. In addition, he is a member of the Foundation Board of the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. He is a member of the Western New England College Capital Campaign Cabinet and is the chair of the Western New England Plan Giving Committee. So you can see no grass grows under his feet. <laughs> Gary is also a member of the adjunct faculty of Berkshire Community College, Westfield State College, and Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts where he conducts seminars educating the public in retirement planning and other financial strategies. He is frequently called upon by the media for his views on asset protection and retirement planning as well as to offer guidance on matters of financial interest. And I'm sure many of you have caught his radio show because it's on quite a few different stations and everything from time to time. Um, Gary always does a fabulous job on that. Now, let's going to move on to another facet of Gary's life. Gary AA1UE and his wife JKA1KGW are both active amateur radio operators. They share their Southampton home with one cat, three dogs, and five shrewd parrots. <laughs> I had to teach him to bring them over to my brother's house there with his birds there. I could probably teach him a few things. <laughs> Long words. <laughs> well, then he'll have to correct them. That, my, that won't be my problem. Okay, so while conducting my background research on our guest speaker, I came across a little known story about Gary. A ham operator told me this story, but it wasn't held in strict confidence. So, in fact, they said I could do it. So we're okay. Now, this ham radio operator stated being present when Gary, AA1, UE came in to take his hams exam at the Holyoke Hospital. Gary paid the fee and took all the exams from novice to extra and the CW to 20 words per minute, all at one session and passed everything. So you see we have a very high caliber speaker for you people. Okay. This person asked Gary if he was in electronics, and Gary said no. He was an attorney who just happened to let his amateur radio license lapse. <laughs> Jim Mullen, KK1W, Jim Allen, WB1Z, ran the exam session, and Dan, N1IVT, is the source of this story. <laughs> okay, so now I would like to have a nice warm welcome for our guest speaker, Gary Thomas. And he's going to uh, tell us about his presentation on the amateur radio satellite. So, Gary, if you could come forward, please. Thank you very much. I can see she's been spying on us, so that's great. And, of course, there, there were three other initials that she uh, mentioned, H-A-M, and we're as proud of those as we are of any of the other degrees that we have. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, actually having me, because it's really a treat for me to talk about uh, an aspect of the hobby that's interested me for many, many years. And I, I think that's a great thing about ham radio, don't you? I mean, whether you're a CW operator or into repeaters or digital modes, there's always something exciting going on. So we're going to discuss satellites, but I'm also going to give you a little bit of history so that you can sort of maybe appreciate how far we've come and maybe where we might be going. Um, I just, I'll just for a moment just uh, this point out what this introductory slide is. This is actually the top of a nose cone 
of a Saturn uh, rocket. And every, where you see the, you can see those, uh, sat, what obviously are satellites there, those uh, rings uh, adjacent to the satellites are holders to hold other satellites and uh, that will be released at, at different times. And the reason I bring that up is because we are so far away from that very first ham satellite and very first satellite that was launched. Um, so may I have the next uh, slide, Rob? And we can move on since you know who we are. If you need to contact me, though, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll give you my cell phone number as well. As you can see, the call is AA1UE at AMSAT. That stands for the, uh, uh, that's the, the organization, the sort of overarching organization that deals with satellites in the United States, dot org. And our cell is 413-575-5000 uh, if you need to reach us. All right, and if I could just uh, have the next next slide, Rob. Russian satellite circling the Earth. Now, what's that have to do with things? Well, you got to think about this now. It was 1957 in October that the very first Russian satellite was launched, Sputnik. And you could see the world was, you know, we were in the middle of what we called the Cold War. We had just you know, not very long before, just about 13 years, be, you know, 12 years before, ended World War II. The Russians, basically, you know, had, had by that time stolen nuclear secrets. They had occupied Germany. And they, and Hitler, uh, not Hitler, but Khrushchev was in the UN. And you'll remember that graphic picture, if, if you're old enough, of seeing Khrushchev banging his shoe on the UN and saying that we will bury you. And, and, you know, we had thought we had come a long way. I mean, the United States had recovered from the fact that uh, we were sending millions of people that were overseas. Our servicemen had come home. The economy had to absorb them. Uh, we had just gone into massive debt uh, building the interstate highway system which was the biggest public works project ever uh, undertaken in the United States. And so here we were, thought that we were doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden, the Russians, those folks with nuclear warheads and nuclear capabilities, had launched a satellite. And it shocked the country. The thought of a satellite circling the Earth that might have a nuclear weapon, that might be spying on the United States, sort of woke us up out of a sleepy kind of 1950s slumber. And it was a tough time even back then. You could see, if you look at this headline, Polish capital swept by riots. Anything sound familiar? It's funny how the more the world changes, the more it stays the same. But it was a shock. And uh, Teamsters elect Hoffa as president. Well, that was probably his last election. <laughs> we haven't found him since. So here we are, 1957, and even, Rob, may I have the next slide? And even then, hams had that desire, because what do hams do if something is up there sending a radio signal? If there's a signal anywhere, hams want to hear it. And so here's a group of amateurs in 1957, a fella had uh, taped the, uh, the Sputnik passing by. And you're going to say, well, how did, they, how did they track that? Now remember, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but remember, you know, you have, well, think about this. If you have a cell phone, you have more computing power than there was in the U.S. military. You know, computers were those kinds of things that were in the basement of the military or large insurance companies. And so the fact that the Russians were able to do the mechanics and do the technical stuff and get that satellite up there way before us was quite a feat. And it didn't, but it didn't take too long. We, in about uh, a little over a year later, just about a year later, we did get our first satellite up through a Vanguard rocket. It had been a Navy project before. And, um, but our, our satellite was only 20% of the size of the Russians. It was small. And again, these were not translating type satellites. They just sent out a beep. They just had a beacon in them. It was a, it was a first effort. Now, you know, in 1961, 
President Kennedy got up and he said in his speech in a State of the Union address that we were going to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely by the end of the decade. Now you think about that. We had just not very long ago put up our first satellite. No man had ever traveled into space. We didn't know what the consequences were going to be. This was going to be a huge and massive and financial undertaking. And we stated it to the world, what a giant risk. And the interesting, and now I don't know, you know, what what you were thinking if you were alive at that time. But I know what your parents were thinking. And I bet I know what my parents were thinking. They were saying, a man to the moon and back? How crazy! What a giant waste of money with so much to do here! The U.S. is in debt. We built the highway system. We've got to build up our military even more. Those Russians are coming. They're trying to take over Europe. And we're wasting our money sending a man to the moon. But it excited a whole generation. Folks that grew up around within 10 years or so of me to get involved in science, get involved in technology. We put money into the school systems. We put money into teachers, and we did get that man to the moon. And we're the only folks that have ever done it. But what happened after, just a little aside here, what happened after, we, after the moon program ended? We had a major contraction. We had major layoffs. This was a huge government program. A lot of people were out of work, and what did they do? They started companies. They started companies like Intel, and they started other companies. And I think a lot of the technology, probably all of the technology that we enjoy today, is a result of that investment, that foolish sending. What does sending a man to the moon have to do with anything that we made then? And that was sort of the courage that folks made, a, a decision. So I just want to, as an aside, whenever somebody talks about a map, and you never know what's going to come from it. Who knew that cell phones were going to come from it, and pocket computers, and basically all of the things that we enjoy today came because we made a commitment to do something that no one had ever done before, that cost money, that created technology, and it was a broad effort, education, engineers, teachers, and the fallout from that uh, tended to, to really make the world that we have today. So whenever there's a, and I think um, just as an aside, one of the things that uh, President Obama said I think that was missed, the meaning of it during his uh, State of the Union address was he said, this is our Sputnik moment. Meaning that that was what, and I don't think the world really appreciates it because we were in a war then, a cold war with the Russians. And I gotta say, we're in a technological war today. We're in a situation where we're probably just as much in danger as we were then, but our enemy is not, you know, wearing, having arms. Our enemy could be ourselves, meaning that we need to get going. So basically, whenever somebody wants to say we're gonna make a technical move forward or make a big investment, there may be consequences that are very positive. Having said that, it excited the youth of that time. Now, you got to think about this. Uh, in 19, you know, just about a year, and uh, let's see, 1957, I think it was in uh, 1961. You want to hit the next slide for me, please? Hams built radio orbiting the Earth. We, a group of hams, developed the the very first amateur satellite. You know, just three years later, three years after the United States launched this, their satellite. Now you gotta think about it. I mean, what a, another crazy idea, right? I mean, could you imagine somebody, uh, you know, saying, their wife saying to them, uh, Harry, how come you're coming back every night at 12 o'clock? You know, is there another woman? <laughs> 
Uh, uh, I'm building a satellite. Uh, no, yeah, a satellite? You mean something that they had to steal German scientists in Russia to build? <laughs> no, no, really, tell me who she is. Who is she? No, honey, I'm building a satellite. And she said, well, I don't know if you're crazy. But there was the time when people had the, they didn't say no. So here you had a group of hams in California that built this very first, what was known as Oscar, Oscar one. Can I, may I have that? And so here's a picture of it. It was in December 1961. It was not a transponder, meaning that it just sent out, and it, it sent out in Morse code, hi, did it, did it, did it. And the thought that it was up there, it could be tracked. Now, incidentally, how you might say, well, gee, hams didn't have, how do they track these kinds of satellites when, you know, how do they even find them? Um, well, we all didn't have computers back in 1961, not even TRS-80s. We had, uh, what we had in order to track those satellites, and I, had, I, st I got my first license in, in 1965, so what we had was the ARRL's code bulletins, and they would transmit on their, on their bulletin when the satellite was passing over certain North American cities. So you could figure, well, if it was going to be over Chicago at one point, and over Boston at another, you can sort of get the idea about when it might be overhead and when you can, how you might be able to track it. So it was 1961, but that just transmitted, it just said, hi, you, it gave us a practice to transmit it. And now, if I may have the next slide. Uh, what happened is that these Oscar satellites, again, uh, we started to move forward. Um, and if I can have the next one. All right, Sputnik, just a timeline. October 1957, Oscar 1, December 1961. Four years later, HAMS had their own satellite up. You know, think about that. Built in a garage. Now, Oscar 3 was the first transponder, and a transponder means that it's like a repeater. It was able to pick up your signal and retransmit it so HAMS could communicate through it. Now, tell, everybody remember Telstar? If you were around long enough, that was, the first that was the first commercial communication satellite. That was launched in 1963. The first transponder was launched in, in 1962. That was called Echo One, and the military launched it. Then, in 1974, this is a little bit of history, uh, another transponder was launched. And it stayed in operation for about 15 years, and then it died. But all of a sudden, in 2002, it mysteriously reactivated itself. <laughs> we figured that the, the batteries had burnt out, and, and so you're, able, you're still able to, to, to communicate through it now, and you can talk to Europe through it, and things uh, basically, if you get it at the right time, uh, on single sideband and, and, and CW, but it only works in the daytime because that's when the, when the solar cells uh, are igniting it. So, uh, also, there, it, in order to get really, really far distances, and we'll talk about this, you need a high orbiting. We're going to talk about the satellites that you, you're going to talk through, or we're going to talk our low orbiting satellites. But in order to uh, have a, a, a wider uh, and more consistent path uh, to talk through the Earth, the, the satellites need to be up much higher. Your communication satellites are about, up about 20,000 miles or so. So they appear to be stationary over the, over the Earth. And so HAMS, again, and, uh, uh, had their first high orbiting satellite in 1983. Uh, second was in 1988. Uh, those are no longer in service. Uh, we had another one um, back about five, six years ago uh, that unfortunately went dead. Uh, that was called AO40 after a period of time. We think there was a big explosion inside. These are huge and very, now it's a heck of a lot more expensive undertaking uh, to launch a satellite. So AMSAT, if, if this is something you get interested in, needs your help. Like we all need, you know, financial help because it's places they don't launch them for nothing anymore. You know, they used to be extra extra payload, but now that it's it's such a uh, uh, 
basically expensive undertaking and every every inch on the top of a rocket is worth a lot of money. So if I can have the next slide, we'll go through a little more history. Uh, right now, what seems to be working is something we call microsats. These are very small satellites. They're about the size of a basketball, even smaller. Uh, they stay up for about a year or two. They're, they're relatively low Earth orbit. That's about 600 to, to 1,000 miles up. And of course, uh, the Russians had their, their basically what was a satellite, their space station. Right now, uh, there's a couple of things going on. Um, in, the, um, in the International Space Station, there's a fully equipped ham station. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have a heck of a lot of time uh, to get on and talk to the average ham, but about once every couple of weeks, they'll talk to a group of school children um, and uh, you might be able to catch them as well. They also come out with something, uh, it's funny, when, when the suits of the astronauts are used up, they have to do something with them. And one of the things that's been done once, and it's going to be done uh, again probably within the next week, is something called suit sat, where they take essentially a transponder, stick it in a space suit, and eject it out the door, and you're able to communicate through that. So. Um, and again, just a little note on, on AO7. So, Did the Russians just send one up for us? Yeah, they, basically they sent up a, a payload to refurbish the, you know, to restock the, the, uh, the space station. Um, so if I can have the next slide. All right, so here we go. Um, we're able to see large, what we call a footprint. In order to communicate with the satellite, you have to be obviously within range. Now, your low orbit, I think we can go to the next one too. Um, next slide. If we go to um, a low orbiting satellite, we have uh, some challenges uh, because a couple of things are going on. One, they do not appear to be stationary above the Earth. They're orbiting the Earth, and what's happening to the Earth while they're orbiting it? The Earth is going around this way, they're orbiting that way. So essentially with these quote unquote low Earth orbit satellites that you can easily communicate with with your handy talkie, and we're going to show you a little some of the techniques and things to, and simple equipment, um, you've got about six passes a day. And usually three are in the morning and three are in the afternoon. Now your first pass might be a thousand miles out for you and a thousand up. So it might appear to be only a few degrees above the horizon. So it might be a relatively short pass for you because it's far away, it's near the horizon. Uh, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get probably your farthest DX with it. The easiest obviously is about once a day it's directly overhead, actually twice, once in the evening and, and once in the uh, morning. And they generally come from south to north at night and north to south in the uh, morning. And where that's important is because with these FM satellites that I'm going to talk to you about, um, they, the ones that you could work with your handy talkie, it's like one frequency, one parking space. And you have a lot of hams trying to get into that same spot. And so the, the contacts are very quick and uh, if once you get over, those satellites get over a city, there's even more competition for it, for the spot. So basically, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, briefly, how do you work in, in these FM, what we call FM birds, stuff that you could do with a handy talkie or two handy talkies and some simple equipment. Um, may have the next uh, slide. All right, so what do you need to talk through these satellites? Well, for a couple of them, you have a choice. There's two low Earth orbit birds, they're called, uh, that will have uh, single sideband and CW. The advantage of, of these two satellites uh, would be the fact, and I'll look, we have a chart to show them uh, in, in a moment, would be that they cover a broad spectrum. So you're not stuck on one frequency like an FM satellite. You're able to move around. There's actually a band of about 50 uh, kilohertz that you could move within, find a station, talk to them, and actually, uh, because there's enough uh, bandwidth there, there could be maybe 10 
guys having conversations at the same time in that 50 kilohertz or, or 100 kilohertz spectrum. Uh, what happens though is this, and we're going to get into this in detail, is that when the satellite is passing over, you're going to experience something called Doppler. And, and the lower the satellite and the higher the frequency, the faster the Doppler. Now, what that means, and, and as you probably know, is that the frequency appears to be moving compared to you. And if you're chasing the and if you're not careful, you could pretty much chase the station right up the band or off the band. So there's a technique to doing that. Uh, so if you want to do, do that, you need a couple of side... Who has uh, 432 and uh, 144 megahertz sideband capability? All right, so about 20% you know, of you. Um, you could do it with one radio if you have some software. The way that I usually do when I'm working that is I have two. I have one radio on 432 and one on 144. Uh, you're going to transmit in general on most satellites up on 144 and you're going to come down on 432. Um, and so for doing that, uh, and you can you could you do it with simple antennas. I know John, you, you, you've been on before. so um, And uh, you can do it without even tr uh, tracking them if, uh, if you set up things right, I mean, in terms of moving your antennas. So what kind of antennas can you use? Um, if you're using a handy talkie, you can't use a rubber duck because nobody's going to get you, okay? Uh, you're going to use something like this. Uh, this, I think, is a diamond antenna. Um, I've got a couple of illustrated in a couple of other slides. But you'll use something like this, pretty long. Uh, you could get by with this maybe at the minimum, but you will not uh, make it with a small duck type of antenna. So you need a little bit of, a, um, of an antenna. You want to get a little bit better. This, um, I'll talk to you what this thing is here in a minute. This is called an arrow antenna. And it's probably the most popular antenna among uh, satellite operators. And you could see it's really two antennas. And in this one here, you've got a, a two meter antenna and you've got a 432 beam. Um, you'll notice that there's two antennas, but there's one cable coming out of that. That's because this one has a, a, a diplexer in it. And so, because one of the things you're going to want to do is, if you can, if you have the radio to do it, is you're going to want to talk duplex. In other words, you're going to be listening while you're transmitting, just like a telephone. Uh, because it's very, very important that you hear yourself. You don't ever want to transmit if you can't hear the sat. You know, a lot of people will transmit into the ether without hearing the satellite or without even knowing that if, if they're coming through. So, by hearing yourself, you can find your signal, you can track it. Now, What's going on with those satellites, though, is they're not staying in the same position compared to you. Not only are they moving towards you or away from you, but they're tumbling in space. And because they're tumbling in space, the, the way the signal arrives, the, it comes off the antenna, the polarization of the signal changes and can change quite rapidly. So if you just have, say, a horizontally polarized antenna, and all of a sudden something changes vertical, you're, you're going to be down, you're going to lose the signal, especially in FM where you're either on or off for the most part. So it's very important when you're trying to find uh, the bird to understand you're going to basically, you'll be all the time, it's sort of searching. So if your neighbors see you out there with something like this, <laughs> and you're not arrested, and we've been approached because I tend to find, uh, I tend to do this in like parking lots. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is parking lots are, you know, basically you, you've got a big space. You've got, a, you know, the, you, so that you can get something low to the horizon because that's where you want and, and track. And, and then, well, what are you doing there? And so now, so this is now if you're going to. What I have here, this is how the arrow comes. Um, this one 
so if you buy it and you buy it in a kit like this, uh, it can be um, all, it's pretty convenient to carry. This one happens to not have a diplexer in it. Uh, so, and the reason for that is sometimes what, I, what you want to do, so you don't have to worry, worry about uh, tracking the satellite while you're transmitting, is use a little higher power while you're transmitting. Uh, if you happen to have, say, an FM radio, uh, 2 meter FM, 25, 50 watts in the car. Um, and when I, when I do that, You've probably seen one of these somewhere in your mother's kitchen. <laughs> it's, called, it's called an egg beater. And, and basically the reason why it's configured this way is you're, it's so that you can have a stationary antenna that basically, and this one has the, the, the if this was a transmitting antenna, which we often use, it, it has sort of a pie you know, a bowl-shaped uh, pattern. And that's really what you want because you want to be able, you don't want to have something like your typical, what happens on your typical vertical antenna in terms of the way the, the signal goes out? It's, you know, it's low to the horizon and then it's got a few lobes sticking up in the air. Well, you want to consistently, if you're not moving, you want to consistently track the satellite. So actually, this has really sort of a bowl-like uh, polarization. Uh, so that uh, you get pretty consistent coverage. I generally use it for transmitting. Um, this thing sort of popped off there on the way in, but that's all right. Um, now, but what if you don't want to invest in one of these things? This, I think this is like 120 bucks or something. You really don't need it. Because how do you get a circular an antenna pattern? You take a quarter wave whip, if it was a and you tilt it like this against ground. And you're gonna, it's going to be just as good, or nearly as good. Uh, in fact, um, out of my house and uh, out of apartments that I've lived at, I've taken... Uh, yes, you had a question? Hmm? No? It would work great. That antenna would... It's perfect. And in fact, you know, you got to hear them first. So uh, I'm going to get to that it's in terms of when we get to the equipment. Um, but... But basically, if you tilt that like that against ground, if you put a, a plate or something, uh, or the trunk of your car, it'll work great. Uh, but how do you hear them? Like, I mean, some, some of you may not have two HTs, but I bet a lot of you have scanners hanging around, right? <laughs> and uh, so there you go. And, and so you got to find them first. So you could use that fine. All right. The, the, um, if you could go to the, so, all right, what other things are, are necessary? Well, when the satellite goes by, things happen pretty fa uh, fast. Sometimes those passes may be as short as seven minutes. The further away they are, the closer they are to the horizon, the shorter that pass is going to be. And... There's going to be a lot of people, you know, throwing out their call sign, and you're going to try to get in and get out. And I got to tell you, sometimes you forget who you talk to. So what you want to do is you you need to tape your um, use a little digital recorder. You could tape it to the back of your HT. The other thing, remember, you're going to be operating duplex. So what happens if you're trying to talk and the speaker is on at the same time? Right? We haven't heard any of that yet, but if I put the mic over there, we're going to know what it sounds like, right? So, important to have some kind of set of headphones uh, so that you're, you're able to uh, essentially uh, not have your, or, you know, not have the audio feed, feeding back or else, you know, you're going to make a heck of a lot of noise through the satellite. So, what are the, the preferred kind of radios for it if you're going to use an HT? Um, if you can find one, one that runs full duplex, a full duplex handy, you know, there's not a lot of them around. A full duplex handy talkie is one where you're transmitting on one band and receiving simultaneously on the other. So, uh, for instance, um, we've got uh, Kenwood... I think the new one does it too. This is the older Kenwood TH7. This one has a, an additional benefit uh, of having a, um, 
having a TNC in it. And so we've used it for digital satellites. I didn't get that's a whole different thing. There's satellites that will transmit uh, tel tel telemetry uh, through them that you could decode or packet signals. So you could use something like that for that if you're into that. Most people just like to have a conversation. Uh, so the Kenwood TH7, this is an older ICOM uh, W32A. They don't make it anymore. Full duplex. Uh, convenient thing, you got two knobs on it too. A lot of the full duplex radios, you're always pressing a button to switch back and forth if you're changing frequency, but there's two knobs so you can you can track the satellite. Um, and But you really, those are preferred. I think uh, Alinko has a new, uh, their brand new radio that's out there is a um, it's a full duplex radio on three bands. But what if you don't have a, and why is full duplex preferred? Because you can hear yourself coming back. You know if you've gotten into the bird. But it's not, if you're courteous and you know you have it and you get decent operating technique, it's not absolutely necessary. What is necessary though is a radio that's, you know, capable of at least receiving on a different band than you're transmitting on. So you'd be transmitting on uh, four, you know, 450, you're receiving on 144. Some of the simpler radios will only you know, receive within band, they won't receive cross band. So make sure your radio has that uh, capability. But you can see, uh, and I think most, you know, most mid-range handy talkies right now, if it's a du will do that. But there is a real key advantage of having a duplex radio uh, and the reason for that is you can hear yourself coming back. You know if you're stepping on somebody, you know if somebody's calling you uh, while you're calling them. Uh, and that often happens. So, you know, they could be calling you, you're calling them, and you completely miss each other. So let's go to the next uh, slide if we could. All right, I just pointed that out. This is really an ideal antenna. Now, interestingly enough, I mentioned that if you have an antenna like this, you know, you're going to be trying to s turn it and, and track the satellite as it comes over. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, tracking. Um, basically, you can do, by the way, how do you find out um, in, a, in a moment? With these kind of antennas, if you put it on the, the HT, weird things happen. Because most of the time when you're going to do this, what I found, it's you want to get a little more gain out of these things than they have. So how do you do it? Well, you're in your parking lot there. You're not arrested yet for doing, you know, for, for being. <laughs> and you par if you know, you've, you basically, because you have your tracking program and you have things plotted out, you put your car in the direction that the satellite is going to be approaching you. All right, so the satellite's going to be approaching you, and then basically what happens is because a Doppler shift, the f it starts at a low frequency and then starts moving up. So you're going to keep your transmit frequency the same, but you have to understand that your receive frequency will be changing, just like that. And I'll show you that uh, an illustration of that in a moment. So you'll be aware of that, and when you first hear the satellite. You're going to notice, but one of the things is when you operate this, the big, big thing is you keep your squelch open. All right, because, if it, you're going to, because the first thing you're going to hear is a change in the noise level as that satellite approaches. And so you keep, and you're not going to hear anybody. You're just going to hear that noise level change. And so when it starts to come over, when you, when it, when you feel that it's approaching you, um, and you might have a printout of a, uh, or you might use your cell phone or whatever, because you're going to know, uh, basically, you have a compass. I forgot to bring a compass, so you know what direction is coming over. And so it's coming over, and, and so you point your car and in, in where it's going to be headed. Now, basically, when that happens, you're going to be sort of like waving around here, and this is before you're arrested. And, uh, and, as a, and you'll notice that the hood of your car is going to act as a reflector. And it's going to increase the gain. And sometimes you have to turn around. Sometimes you have to do something crazy like this to get 
a stronger signal because you that signal is coming in the the satellite's twisting you don't know what what polarization it has so basically it's it's almost like a dousing rod or you know some kind of palsy or something so as as the satellite passes overhead you actually are going to walk around your car and you're going to use that top as a reflector and you're going to do the same thing and then it goes down and uh and interestingly enough, it, I, we've done weird things where like, all right, you're pointing it against the back of the car. So it, it don't be, but I mean, the thing that you're not going to do is like stand like this. <laughs> all right, because it's not going to work. So a little, little bit of a technique about, you know, how to bring attention to yourself in public places. <laughs> um, if we can have the next slide, I think it points out the arrow. Uh, the great thing about this thing is, I'll just take it apart so that you could see what it is. It's called the arrow antenna because guess what? Who's, a, who's pretty observant here? <laughs> That's right. It's, it's made out of arrow shafts. And the guy that, uh, so basically, and, and I mean, you, could, you, you don't need to actually buy one of these things, although uh, they're cheap enough and they break down nice. And, um, but you could, you could do this pretty much the same thing with a wood dowel and welding rods. And uh, the thing is, is to get it to match. And these things match very, very nicely. Uh, the other thing is it uh, comes with a nice little sponge handle here. And if you get this model, it has that built-in uh, diplexer. Um, and I can tell you, just, it's just convenient uh, to have it. Um, what, what some folks do, though, is they will take a sort of like a hacksaw blade or a hacksaw handle and they'll use it to hold it. Uh, I know that you're wondering if this is, if we're gonna, <laughs> I, I, promise not, I promise not to make you a shish kebab with this. <laughs> I could tell she was ducking. <laughs> I, I, you know, if, if I'm, if, not knowing me, I don't blame you, you know, so there you go. <laughs> So, so basically, so this very, very popular type of antenna. Now you could use a lot more sophisticated things. Um, you know, I, I have um, a setup at home where it'll track automatically from the house, but uh, it's not not really needed uh, for working the FM birds. Um, but the less you have to think about, the the better off you are because you're trying to do multiple things. Uh, may I have the next slide if I could? All right, who's this character there? Yeah, there's, there's one of us in a public place. Uh, you know, basically, and this actually, this was where we were making, this was, the, I don't know, it's really not too clear because you can't see the part of, but this is the egg beater, uh, part of the egg beater antenna right there. It looks like a flagpole coming out of our head. And, uh, but basically the thing is, so all you needed to do, cause, and so the transmitting was taken care of, and all we needed to do was find, you know, hear the bird. So. Uh, so it's it's pretty they're pretty easy to find. Uh, let's go to an, another slide. All right. So we mentioned this that most of your satellites, your low Earth orbit, uh, are about a thousand miles or so high, um, and so there's there's an orbit every ninety to a hundred uh, minutes at that height. So you end up getting six a day. Um, and as I mentioned, while the satellites are going this way. The Earth is going that way, and you're, you have them for about 15 minutes. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, and I think I explained the difference. Now, interestingly enough about um, the, the high Earth orbit satellites that we, we've had up, uh, your typical communication satellite really appears to be stationary above the Earth uh, because it's in a very tight orbit over the poles. And, and that way, you know, basically one hemisphere uh, has the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, has access to that satellite at all times. Well, ham radio satellites have, have turned out to be sort of an international effort. We use basically, you know, uh, German hams and J Japanese hams and Australian hams and Indian hams all work together in coordinated way to try to get one of these high Earth orbit satellites up. So if the orbit was only stationary over one pole, then half of the Earth 
would be sort of left out. So ham satellites have this very, very sort of elongated orbit that, that goes out as much as, say, 60,000 miles, or, excuse me, 30,000 kilometers. It's, so, I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty good DX, don't you think? Uh, and, and back. Now, the thing about those is because they're up so high and far away, they don't appear to be moving as fast from our point in Earth. And guess what? The Doppler shift on those is very, very much slower. So they're a lot, a lot easier to track. You don't have to worry about changing frequencies. But right now, there's not one up. So uh, the low Earth orbits, basically, uh, it might be 10 to 20 minutes per pass, four to six passes a day. There's a high Doppler rate. You're, you're always shifting. Your, you're probably shifting your receive frequency um, at least 10 times during those, those passes. But we call them the easy sets because you can work them with an HT. Um, may I have the next one? All right, so which ones are up right now that you can, you can work? Um, AO7, if you have now um, worked AO7, uh, basically the setup I use for that um, is, you know, basically a, a couple of ICOM uh, sideband, you know, uh, radios, uh, uh, and you can use the little Kenwood uh, uh, QRP rig. I've used that. Uh, basically, um, and the, the advantage of some of those radios is that they have a little jack on the back that hooks to your, remember your serial port on your computer that's hard to find now, which that will control the frequency. And there's a ton of programs out there that, that basically... Uh, from, from a very small donation to, uh, from AM, to AMSAT that will, if you have a, a portable computer with, say, a serial port, uh, an old laptop, uh, you'll be able to, you know, automatically have that Doppler figured for you. Uh, and I found that of great help uh, because uh, I have three offices, uh, one in, in Pittsfield and, and one in Northampton and, and one in West Springfield, excuse me, and, you know, sometimes if I know there's a satellite and I'm driving out there, the computer will take, I won't have to worry about Doppler shift. I'll just have to find somebody to, to uh, talk to. Uh, but if you have a couple of, um, you know, even QRP rigs, it, it's fine. Uh, even you can use one. Uh, there's programs out there that will automatically, uh, you know, take care of the Doppler. So you don't necessarily have to hear the person coming back, but it, it's preferred. AO51 is an FM bird. It's about four years old. Uh, VO52 was launched. By the way, AO7 is the highest one up right now. So if uh, during certain passes, you can hit Europe from here, South America. AO51 is an FM bird. was launched in the United States. VO52 was, is, was created primarily by Indian hams. SO50 is another FM. ISS is the space station. AO27 is an FM bird, and I'll show you a typical frequencies on those. You can go to the amsat.org, amsat.org website. It'll show you the frequencies, but I'm going to show you in the next slide or so how to program your HT. Uh, this just shows a typical footprint. Uh, if you buy a tracking program, it's going to look something like this, and um, it's difficult to see on this slide. Uh, maybe in the next one we can see it a little bit better. Uh, basically, here's what you'll see is that in this instance, you have um, a particular satellite, AO27 or so. This is, uh, and it tells you, all right, where, where is it right now? And this is what your tracking program will tell you. How, what's its, you know, what direction is it in? How high up is it? So this one here, AO27 is in view of this station, uh, but it's only 8.8 .8 degrees above the horizon. All right, so it's either going to be below the horizon pretty quick or it's coming in our direction. Uh, and it tells you how high it is. And uh, it also, your typical program tells you when you're going to receive it and when you're going to lose it. The AOS is your acquisition time, and LOS is when loss of signal. And it will tell you, your program will tell you how long the pass is going to be. In this case, it was going to be 10 minutes and, and 32 seconds. So that's what a typical program will look like 
uh, if you have it. They don't all look that way. Uh, how many of you have smartphones? Or smart, okay, so if you have a smartphone or any kind of a PDA or, uh, well, there we go, lost our egg beater. Um, <laughs> iPad, there, there's a myriad programs for them. You don't even, if you have a connection to the internet, you, it, the programs are convenient, uh, but you don't need it. Um, you've probably gone, you, there's two other places. If you go to the AMSAT website and you put in your location, your longitude and, and latitude, uh, it will, you'll find out the passes of the satellites that would be overhead. They have something called the AMSAT news service. Not, and, and a chart, is not every satellite is active at every time on at stated frequencies. So if you go to the AMSAT site and you hit on the AMSAT news service and what active satellites are, there will be a chart that will tell you what satellites are active, what frequency they're on, uh, and uh, and then you can put that into the into the basically AMSAT software for free, or you could use other programs like Heavens Above. Anybody been to the Heavens Above website? And you're able to basically you know track any kind of uh, moving uh, object. I, I heard there's something like 21,000 pieces of space junk up there right now. So that's what a typical program might look like. Um, Rob, can I have the next slide? All right, so we mentioned the Doppler effect. And, and, you know, just again, this is something that we're all familiar with if we've been near a train. Uh, and the fact that if something is, um, as it comes for us, the, the, the frequency changes. And this is no different. Uh, what you want to do is, in general, you're going to keep your transmit frequency the same. And you're going to understand that you're going to be changing your receive frequency. So... Um, most good, the other thing is, is most HTs will, FM HTs, well, you'll be able to change the step. And you're going to want to change, the normal step might be, you know, 15 or 25 kilohertz. You're going to want to change that step to 5KC segments, all right, when you do that. Because, uh, you know, in, 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 you could change it if you had one that was finer, like, uh, you know, this uh, AOR scanner, which is about 10 years old, but still pretty hot, that'll go to 1, 1 KC steps uh, on FM. But uh, you really don't need that much because the, the bandwidth of FM is, is wide enough. Again, you want to keep your squelch open. Uh, next slide just sort of shows you what, uh, Rob, uh, basically, you know, typically what happens. You've got um, your you're going to acquire your signal close to the horizon and uh, again you're going to be and you'll know what time it is because your your program will tell you all right the satellite is going to be at 170 degrees from where you are at you know 12 12 32 in the afternoon and it's going to be three degrees above the the earth and then it's good then you're gonna then your program will say well at 1235 it's going to be five degrees and at 1240 it's going to be 10 degrees so you're gonna know exactly where it is re in relation to you and you sort of have to I mean you could see that this waving things like this in the air is not what you call alt, you know it's it's not that precise it doesn't need to be um, and because you'll find it it's there once you hear it um, and this next um, slide Rob just points out what we're saying you have to you don't want to hold your antenna in, in, in you know vertically you're trying to find it you're, you're tipping it you're turning it here he's you, this gentleman's holding it uh, at an angle uh, uh, because the, the the bird is either behind him or, or on the side of him uh, and I guess the next slide sort of is sort of a wrap start oh this is this shows typically how you would um, program your for I think this is SO50 uh, basically what you're what you're noticing here is that one thing your transmit frequency is always the same and that's mid band all right of the, the mid part of the pass so but what's happening with the with the receive frequency it starts at 436815 and it does what it goes down at the end of the pass it goes to 436 7900 so basically as it's as it's coming toward you you're 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 cranking that down 
Uh, you're keeping your sweat squelch open. Now some of these, uh, not all of the satellites, but some of the satellites require a tone to access. And that's to keep, um, I mean one of the real problems that we've had for a while is bootleggers. And uh, when I say that, not bootleggers trying to use the, the satellite, but uh, more than once we've heard like Mexican taxi cabs and things like this come through the satellite. So most of the, the newer birds uh, have, a t you know, our tone accessed. So you're going to have to have a tone to probably turn them on. And sometimes they're, they're you know, uh, you have to have it every time you transmit. Other ones you don't. So you're going to follow that through. And um, so basically that's, that's pretty much that. Um, next slide. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, is that there has to be a protocol. If, if remember, the, it, if you are changing your transmit and receive at the same time, everybody better be doing it simultaneously or else you're going to be, you know, working to try to find the guy. Um, and um, because uh, basically, uh, I, some people do change the transmit, but if, if we all decide, hey, we're going to keep our transmit frequency the same, because guess what? The, the input frequency of the bird is the same, but we change our receive frequency, we're able to track it a little, we're able to, to follow it. Uh, no, not, I mean, it, it really, and the other thing, there's, satellites have pretty good, pretty good ears, but, but they're very, very, the output signals are very weak, um, and this is another reason why you're going to change it to, to follow it. They, they can hear, and this is why you want to be able to hear things before you transmit, they can hear it. You want to keep your, your power... Well, later, I got to talk to my family. Who the heck is that? Uh, my children. Oh, well, that's actually, you want to put that back. That's the International Space Station. Well, maybe I got to talk to my family. Maybe uh, my children, Jenna, he and he in grade school, maybe once a week. And I talk to my wife maybe every other day for about five minutes. Over. Yeah, so that's a typical, I think that was a school thing. Yeah, that's a school concept. Yeah, that's a school concept. A school contact. But, um, but, it, but the, the thing is, the satellites are, now it's running like AO27 output. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the director has spoken. <laughs> yeah, the, the AO, um, AO27 output is six tenths of a watt. All right, six tenths, you know, I mean, you, you know, you, six tenths of a watt. I mean, six tenths of a watt, uh, at least a thousand miles away. So hearing it, it but it, the receivers are hot, you know. I mean, if you were on top of Mount Greylock, you could hear a lot. If you're on top of the world, you could hear even more. So, so basically, and, and this is it, why if you have a, the ability to, re, uh, to hear your signal coming down, it's important because you get people that um, just keep on transmitting CQ, CQ, or whatever, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it's very difficult. I have on that computer... Um, and it's not a very good one. I have, but I have what a typical uh, pass sounds like. Uh, and if I may, if you find, um, if you close the that slide, I think there's a wrap up though. Let's do the wrap up, and then we'll find. Uh, these are essentially. Uh, this is how you contact AMSAT. Um, and there's a, a woman, Martha, there that she, she's been there for like 40 years. So she, she's like their only paid employee. Uh, it, it's, it's a very lean organization. Um, and I happen to be a life, a life member, but anything you do is appreciated. Uh, if, you, if you'd like some help in any reason, for any reason, because um, I'll, I'll be happy to coach you and, and, or you can come over and we could go in a parking lot and get arrested together for... <laughs> What are these two guys doing pointing those antennas around? So, uh, And now, Rob, what I'll do is uh, I'm going to find that file and play it. You really got to enjoy ham radio when you hear that, right? <laughs> and that's how it sounds when it first comes. It's, you're just breaking the squelch. That, that's the very beginning of the pass. Jurgen's question was, how, how automated can you be? Um, well, you could be, 
I guess you would say completely automated, meaning that um, if you have an, an L as rotor that has a, a you know serial output of some kind, and if it doesn't, you can build an I interface. Uh, basically, the the software will control the the elevation uh, and the uh, the direction, uh, so it will track the satellite. It'll also track uh, change your frequency for you. That's really sort of important if you if you're on sideband and, and you're you know uh, uh, because. Um, you're, it's not so important on an FM bird. Uh, with the FM birds, if you, you know, if you have like 100 watts into a wet noodle, you don't want to use a beam on 100 watts because what would happen is, is you would, what we would call, you desense the bird. And that's one of the things, and they'll shut it down. So if there's too strong a signal that comes in there. So you're going to use, if you were going to use, say, 100 watts, you'd use just a vertical antenna or a, an egg beater or something like that. That's the most you'd want to use on your uplink. Uh, and then you just have to worry about, you know, receiving it. And, and I, to be very frank, I mean, Ben, um, I've worked... Uh, these things, I mean, from inside, uh, from, from college, from inside of a dorm room. And I mean, that shows you how, and, and so you're there like, you know, pointing through. Now, you're not going to have the longest contact in the world if you're not using the, you know, the, but, but basically, um, and of course, the more automated you are, the more you could sit back and have a conversation. Uh, I had a tape of... Um, uh, a sideband uh, QSO, and it's more like just like because there's more because we're automated and there's more you know uh, band, room on the band. It's just like having a regular conversation uh, with a guy, uh, except when I you put it into the computer for some reason uh, uh, the distort there was too much distortion, so we couldn't I couldn't use it tonight. Uh, but basically, you could sit back. And, and just have a conversation. But you don't need to be. I mean, you could be as unautomated as having an HT and, uh, you know, a, a, a rubber duck type of thing. Uh, so that's, I guess that's pretty, you know, pretty much. It, it's, it's an aspect of the hobby that's changing, uh, but it is challenging. And, and one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's challenging now is because um, I think... Well, I think if we, we look at our hobby, uh, we're not attracting as many, I think, active young people into our hobby as when I was a, a teenager. I, and when I was a teenager, I was president of the high school radio club. There was about 25 high school kids that most of them went on to become, you know, engineers and other things that were in the radio club. And, you know, and same in college. And now... Uh, but, you know, and I guess it's because we all have a desire to, to communicate in some way. And so a lot of the kids today are on, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever they're communicating in, in their own way. But I, I think, um, you know, as we get older, sometimes we just want to sit back and, and, you know, not get out there in the middle of the parking lot attracting attention or, or whatever. But... Uh, uh, so, so AMSAT is, I think, you know, like anything else, things are getting more expensive. The members are getting older. The kind of, because our space program has really been cut back dramatically, uh, there's not as many experts out there that can volunteer their time because it's all based upon volunteers. So I think this aspect of the, the hobby is, is ha like, like the hobby in general is having some challenges. And... Uh, so, you know, you give it a try. It's like a lot of things. You try it, you might even, you might even like it. Um, one of the exchanges, one last thing. One of the, the things you may have heard briefly on that short audio clip was uh, on FM was the exchange. It wasn't very long, was it? It was like a contest exchange. Um, and there was no real signal reports given in general. Uh, you were either in or out like FM uh, and, but what was exchanged was grid squares. And as, as you may know, uh, you know, a grid square, a maidenhead square is, I think it's like a 60 by 60 mile or so uh, location. And so, uh, and, and the, the world is divided up into these. We happen to be in one that's, uh, 
noted as FN32, that's just an arbitrary location. So you exchange grid squares, and a lot of folks, you know, they collect just like every other aspect of the hobby. They collect QSL cards, they collect grid squares, there's awards for worked all states, worked 100 grids, worked 200 grids. Uh, so if you're an awards hunter, there's something for you. Um, if I don't think anybody's worked all counties on satellite yet, but uh, somebody will. And uh, but it, it's a it's a great aspect. There's you could work all continents on on the birds that are still in existence today. So um, that's pretty much wraps it up. Are, are there any things that I can answer for you? I, yes. Uh, so basically, with five watts in a, in a portable unit, you, you feel that this is achievable. Oh, with yeah. with five watts and a handy talkie. Uh, you can get into the, the bird. In fact, um, I didn't bring it because I, I don't want to make it too difficult, but if you've had, um, you've seen one of those like little Alinko and uh, uh, HTs that run, they're about half the size of a pack of cigarettes and they run three quarters of a watt max. Work satellites with that. If they're overhead, remember, they can hear you. And, and the whole thing is, and sometimes, uh, folks will give you a break if you say handheld or something like that, you know, your call in handheld. Uh, the, the other, the, the more powerful stations will generally, if, the, if, they can, if you can hear yourself coming back, will allow you to make a contact. They'll get you in there. Now typically, remember, there's only one spot, one channel available on these FM birds if you choose to use them. So, you know, you, you say, hey, you might make three, three quick contacts and let somebody else that's trying to get in there uh, to do it. But just any handy talkie today, you got to think about it. The equipment we have today is so far superior to what it, it is for what hams had, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, satellite communication with amateur radio is 50 years old this year. 19, December 1961, we launched our first ham satellite 50 years ago, you know, a half a century. So we're so far, our equipment is so far, so much better, so much cheaper, so much easier to use than what was available during the 50s where everything had to be built in, in, in a way and uh, uh, it was and hand wired and it was pretty expensive. So, Ernie? stationary ham satellite? Uh, that's a good question. The question is, will, will there ever be a day that we'll have a geostationary or even a very, very high Earth orbit one again? The last attempt at that was something called AO40. And it was an extremely sophisticated satellite uh, that had multi-modes. It was comparable to, you know, any kind of communication satellite up there. Um, it cost literally tens of millions to, to get, it went from the old days when a $50,000 donations can launch a satellite to be in a multi-million dollar project. It, um, I tracked it, it lasted for a couple of months and then something went wrong like there was a, it had uh, booster rockets inside of it and one of them apparently went wrong and the satellite we think blew up, it, just, it disappeared. And so and, and here's the thing, it, so it takes such a long time to build and raise the money for one of these high Earth orbit satellites that the trend has been to put up a lot of several low Earth orbit satellites that are, there's usually three or four or five working at any given time just to try to stimulate interest because it, it was, it's a long way to get, and now because of the fact that it's become so expensive, nobody's going to give you a ride anymore free on a rocket. This space is at a premium. So um, unfortunately, I, I think even though they're on the drawing board, uh, the German uh, ham organization, I believe, has one on the drawing board. In fact, they would like to send a, 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 a transponder to Mars. That's one of their goals. Um, if you don't have a success relatively rapidly, then people tend to lose interest. So it's been uh, putting up more modest things more often. Uh, yeah, Rob? How much of this will be applied to have you done anything with moon bounce? Uh, have I done anything with moon bounce, EME? The physics are the same, uh, but, but I haven't. Um, up until about three years ago, 
Uh, but there's reasons to do things now, and I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. Up until about three years ago, I was living in um, Springfield, and it had a very small city lot. And, and for moon bounce uh, or EME, you need pretty large antennas. Um, all that, by the way, has changed in about the last five years or so. Um, a guy named Joe Reisert, who was, uh, I believe he was in, he's from Rutgers, uh, developed some software in using sound cards where basically uh, you wouldn't have a conversation like this, but with maybe a long Yagi pointed at the moon, you can basically you know, talk to, communicate, I won't say talk, with another station uh, digitally. And you know, you see the computer reading it out. Other thing that happened is um, Arecibo in, in, in Puerto Rico has been used last summer uh, somehow we managed to get them to uh, allow hams allowed to use that. And so there were two weekends last July where basically we're able to hear signals coming from the moon, but it didn't have the wherewithal at the time to, to send it up. Why? Because that big dish is like, a, I think it's a quarter of a mile in diameter. It, it may even be larger than that. So. Uh, a lot of gain there. Uh, but as far as tracking the moon, again, not as much Doppler because it's further away and, and doesn't seem to move as, as quickly in relation to us. Uh, but I think it's only a matter of time because now you can communicate with somebody else across the globe with a single Yagi and a computer and about 100 watts. Um, any other thoughts? Hey, I, I want to thank you for uh, staying and I don't want to keep you from the coffee and the donuts, so uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you'll go to amsat.org and join. Thank you. Well, we wanted to thank you too, Gary, for sharing uh, your evening with us and, and your passion for satellites. It was very, very interesting and very much appreciated.